All right, so next speaker is, are you, are you ready? I'm ready. So next speaker is David Nadler, and he'll finally <laughs> title, I are given graphs. Great. So thank you very much to the organizers uh, for inviting me and also for hosting such a wonderful week. Um, yeah, so what I'd like to talk about is, um, is joint work with Danny Alvarez Gavela and Yasha Ali Ashberg. And uh, it's been in progress for years, but it's in some kind of uh, further state of progress, uh, I hope, uh, recently. So I'm going to, um, yeah, so let me, let me uh, start with some background and then I'll state uh, uh, the theorem and spend much of the talk uh, explaining the theorem, okay? So, and I hope this is visible from the back. I've tried to write big. It'll probably get smaller as we go. Okay, so um, I'd like to start just by reminding you of a kind of standard uh, construction of Hamiltonian mechanics, which is just to say that if you start with X, a smooth manifold, and you're interested maybe with a coordinate, local coordinate uh, Q, and you're interested in mechanics on X, well, you traditionally now pass to the cotangent bundle of X, the phase space. So phase space. Uh, and where you also now have canonical coordinates, uh, P or Q and P. Okay, and one lesson, uh, well, also you have now a symplectic structure with uh, primitive lambda. So lambda is the usual P D Q form, and omega is D lambda. And one now long-standing uh, point of view is that anything that you possibly can say here, you should be able to say here, and vice versa. So you're typically interested in questions about symplectic geometry or symplectic topology. Symplectic topology. So I'll be more specific in a moment. Um, but the, the point of view is that you hope or you expect, as far as we know, as far as, far as I guess I know, uh, the symplectic topology of the cotangent bundle is equivalent to the algebraic topology of X itself. Okay. And this gives you a means, you can look at this as a means to make calculations here in terms of more uh, traditional objects here. Um, so let me just, uh, as an example of this, kind of well-known example, so um, let's think of the, uh, of the A model. Maybe I should, let me just continue here. So, uh, is there an eraser? Ah. Okay, so uh, as an example, you can be interested in the A model of, uh, of the cotangent bundle. So mathematically, we would typically organize this by some kind of Fleur or Fukaya theory. So Fleur Fukaya theory. Fukaya theory. And you can ask to describe this in some way in terms of the algebraic topology here. So the, uh, an answer to this is uh, string topology or a path geometry, I'll just write path geometry, so geometry of paths, and as well known that the Fleur-Foucaia theory becomes Morse theory here. Okay, in particular, things like the, the boundary conditions, so Lagrangian brains, here are the boundary conditions, and here the boundary conditions are just submanifolds. And the way, of course, you pass from submanifolds to Lagrangian brains is to take conormals. Okay, so there's a kind of whole dictionary um, between these two sides, and one can think of this as somehow harder, but the thing you're interested in, and this is the, the easier, uh, the answer, so to speak. Okay, so the goal of the talk, um, let's see, the board organization is not very good. The goal of the talk is to discuss the potential of finding an inverse to the arrow at the top. Okay, so the, I'll uncover this in a moment, so the goal so the goal of the talk, that's not very bright. Let's see. Is that visible? Okay, anyway, the goal of the talk is to try to write down some kind of an inverse in general. And I'll explain as we go what I mean by that. Okay, 
So um, maybe just to make it more precise from the start, what I mean is that we will be given some kind of a phase space and we'll try to extract from it some topological space so that one can view the phase space as its kind of cotangent bundle. Okay, so what I'd like to do, okay, so um, let me talk about a situation where this is, this is well known, and uh, that's in the case uh, where our phase spaces are two-dimensional, so the case of Riemann surfaces, okay? So, um, yeah, so, so uh, an example, example of successful inverse, inverse, Okay, so this is when the dimension of M is 2. So the real dimension of M is 2. And here we're in the, so the case of surfaces. Okay, so given a, a surface, so here's a, a surface, pair of pants. Um, <clears throat> we can try to extract some space from it that, you know, so that this surface is the cotangent bundle. And of course, one thing we can extract is a kind of ribbon graph. So if I draw the, the surface again, you can find inside of the surface a graph. Maybe this red is better. I don't know. Let's see. So you can find inside of the surface a graph. that knows all of the geometry of the surface, okay? Now, <clears throat> so this is a graph gamma. Gamma equals a graph inside the original surface. And the graph knows all of the geometry of the surface if we include the ribbon structure on the graph. So at each vertex, we, of course, have a kind of orientation coming from the symplectic structure. So we see an orientation at each vertex. And let's see, if I draw it on the back, I guess it would go something. Did I do that right? No. <laughs> Question? No. Okay. okay, it would go something like this. Um, so we have a graph, and then I'll write kappa for the ribbon structure. Ribbon uh, structure, which is to say is a cyclic order, cyclic order of edges at each vertex. Okay, and it's well known that one can reconstruct the Riemann surface from the graph just by thickening it. Okay, but I'd like to emphasize um, a kind of, uh, you know, computation that one can make also if we go back to the A model where we said that, okay, here the A model can be completely described in terms of something about path geometry on X. This is still a situation where the A model of this surface can be described completely in terms of this ribbon graph. So let me just remind you um, about uh, the A model in this case. So A model in this case. Okay, so, so I'm just going to tell you the answer. So we're interested in uh, the Fukaya category of this or however, however you want to think about the A model. The answer should always be the same and it should be given by the following computation in terms of the ribbon graph. Okay, so what I'm going to des describe for you is an is a object uh, that one can assign to the ribbon graph. So to every edge, one should assign a vector space, vector space, V. Okay, so given an edge, you ever see an edge, give yourself a vector space. And if you ever see a vertex, well, in general, vertices can come in many different flavors, but generically, they come in two flavors. So generically, they come in the flavor of trivalent vertices or uh, univalent. Okay, so you may see a picture like this, or you just may see a picture like this if your curve maybe isn't stable, okay? So, so these are the generic possible pictures, and we can always arrange to be in that case. Okay, so what do you see? So in this case, if you have imagined that you assigned a vector space to each of these edges, then there's a relationship given by this vertex, which is that the three vector spaces form a distinguished triangle. Okay, so you see a V1, a V2, and then a V3, and depending on your ribbon conventions, they form a distinguished triangle. Maybe I'll ignore gratings, but maybe just put it here just to emphasize that it's a distinguished triangle, 
distinguished triangle. Okay? And if you ever see a univalent vertex, you should just assign zero. Okay? So no brain can kind of move along past this boundary. Okay? Okay, so this is a complete, you can view this as a complete calculation of the A model because the global, so the global uh, category of brains, global brains, are just given by these local assignments assembled together. So they're just assemblies, assemblies of these local assignments. Okay, so this is a, a case where one can go beyond just a, a cotangent bundle and achieve something by reducing your, uh, your phase space to some kind of smaller space, decorated space. Okay, so the higher ribbon graphs in the title of the talk is that I'm going to try to explain a, a, a direction one can go uh, in higher dimensions. Okay, so the goal is to, to kind of reproduce this story in some form in higher dimensions. Okay, I would ask if there are questions, but I know from the week the answer, there will just be silence. So I, I learned from uh, Alde that one should just say fantastic and continue on. Okay, so questions or no? Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so the goal of the talk is to, to, to kind of generalize this picture. So let me um, start now a bit more precisely with what kinds of phase spaces we want to generalize this to, okay? And the class that I'm going to use are, are what uh, mathematicians, I don't know if physicists use the name, are Weinstein manifolds, okay? So, uh, so... So phase spaces of interest in this talk okay, will be non-compact symplectic manifolds, and they'll have the following uh, picture, so definition. So a Weinstein manifold, Weinstein manifold is a manifold W together with a one form lambda, so the symplectic form, so that's the, the end of the definition. There will be various properties we'll insist on. The, um, the symplectic form is d lambda. Okay, so this is symplectic, so it's an exact symplectic manifold, but it should have some further properties. So let me draw a picture, and then we'll fill in what the further properties should be. So first, it, it should be compact in one direction, but as you expand the geometry, it should have a conic end. Okay, so there's some interesting topology happening up to some point, and then after that point, it has a conic end. Okay, now the conic end is made precise by the fact that one can introduce the Liouville vector field, which is just given by the symplectic uh, pair of the, the one form. So this is a vector field, and you're just asking that the vector field be conic. Okay, and to further... Um, control the geometry, one typically assumes that there exists uh, a function, say a Morse function, Morse function f from w, okay, so a real valued function, and you want it to look like this picture, you want it to have the properties that you see in this picture. So the first is that it's bounded below, so bounded below, it should be proper, okay? Um, <clears throat> And it should be compatible with the structure here so that Z is gradient-like. So Z should be gradient-like for F. Okay? And I'll also assume that the number of critical points is finite. Okay? So we can, uh, you can consider kind of, you know, Riemann surfaces with infinitely many, you know, infinite genus, but I'll assume that there's finitely many critical points. Okay, so okay, so this is a Weinstein manifold, and this is going to be the kind of phase spaces that we're going to to study. Let me just make a, a remark about the the standard examples that everyone says when one explains what this definition is supposed to encode. So the first example is um, a cotangent bundle. So uh, W is the cotangent bundle. So maybe for this case, uh, one should uh, allow that you not only have a Morse function, but maybe you have a bot Morse function. And then maybe not finitely many, but compact critical points. Okay. Um, the second main source of examples are um, uh, smooth affine complex varieties. So W, uh, say, inside Cn is a smooth 
affine variety. Okay, so it's a manifold, and in fact, being embedded in CN like this, so it's an open part of a Kähler manifold, and this is, so this, you can, you can view Weinstein as being, so maybe Weinstein, I don't know how these people feel about their names being used in this form, but Weinstein is like, uh, is like Kähler, you know, minus uh, a divisor. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and maybe just as a kind of a can't resist, especially following Okunkov, is that one can also think of W as being uh, another example, a kind of hyperkeller example, is W like a symplectic resolution. Okay. So this has a kind of no a priori complex geometry, this has Kähler geometry, and this has some hyperkeller geometry. Um, okay. Uh, so let me just remind you of some basic properties that one sees when uh, one has a Weinstein manifold. So the first thing in the context of what we're doing is that one can look at the locus of points of the manifold that don't escape to infinity under the flow of Z. Okay? So inside of this manifold, there's a stable set. I don't know how to draw it. Okay, so this stable set. Um, so right over here. So uh, the, this red, Stable set definition is the skeleton, or some people call it the core, of the Weinstein manifold. So L equals the stable set uh, of Z inside of M. Okay, so it's the points that don't escape. Okay, so this red is L, and it's a standard exercise that this set is isotropic with this setup, so in particular, at, uh, no more than half dimensional. So exercise. Uh, L is isotropic, so uh, dimension of L is less than or equal to half the dimension of M. Okay, and so these manifolds, as is well known for uh, af smooth affine varieties, they have the the homotopy theory of a half-dimensional uh, uh, cell complex. Okay, so this is the the kind of phase spaces that. Um, uh, that I want to study. And so the naive starting point for f sol solving this problem is what we would like to do is given any one of these Weinstein manifolds, we'll just assign its skeleton. Okay, so that's, if you accept this bot morse point of view, in this case for T star X, the skeleton is of course the zero section. And so we should see what generalizes uh, the zero section. Well, it's the skeleton here. Where's the erase? Okay, so. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so a naive starting point, as I said, is to take a so naive attempt at our goal is we start with W lambda, a Weinstein manifold, and what we assign to it is its skeleton. So L, the skeleton. Okay, so this is a nice topological space that we can try to study, and maybe, so I don't know whether I should say the, the good news or the bad news. So let me, let me do the good news first, and then, and then the, the, the bad news. Okay, so the good news, the good news is this is often beautiful. I mean, it's often uh, beautiful and solves the problem. Okay, so maybe let me just mention a, a couple of well-known cases, uh, some examples that are just be good to keep in mind. So on beyond ribbon graphs, the next case uh, one could study is, um, is uh, surface, I mean, let's see, yeah, surfaces. Um, so, uh, so maybe just to remind people, the ADE uh, surface singularities or resolutions, surface resolutions, have beautiful skeleta, so the L just looks like these uh, chains, I don't know what one says, Dinkin diagrams of P1s. Okay, so that's the skeleton, and certainly it's true that one can read off, for example, the geometry of the A model from this, this picture. Um, maybe another example that I think is very beautiful 
I learned from uh, Ben Gamage. So one can go back to the pair of pants in one dimension and ask, how did that, what, what is the skeleton there? And if, you, if we unroll the fundamental group of the pair of pants, we'll see the following. So if we look inside the pair of pants, so inside the pair of pants, we have this graph, which just to redraw looks like, probably this is well, way too small. Is it, is it Swedish? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me let me draw uh, tr try to explain what I was going to say here. So, so the the um, inside the pair of pants we have this this beautiful skeleton, this kind of ribbon graph. And one way you can get this, so this equals the following beautiful picture. You can tessellate the um, the plane by hexagons. Okay. And then divide out by translations. Okay, and then divide out by by there's a z mod two a z squared of translations, and you'll get exactly this graph. And what you will find, in fact, what what Ben explains in higher dimensions. So one can write down a higher dimensional pair of pants. So uh, in higher dimensions, higher dimensions, the skeleton there's a natural skeleton of the pair of pants is given by, you take, instead of the hexagon, you take a permutahedron tiling and divide out by lattice symmetries. So it's the permutahedron tiling, hedron tiling, divide out by translations. Okay, so these are the situations where there's kind of, in my mind, there's kind of nothing, there's no real question. You, you, you're very happy with the skeleton. It's uh, its its own beautiful object. But uh, in general, the skeleton will be quite uh, complicated. So I'd like to just t take a moment to convince you that in general, the skeleton as presented just to here won't be something that you can get very far with. Okay? Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, so Okay, so um so the bad news bad news is that there's kind of two bad newses that come together, I mean, that are kind of maybe two, two sides of the same thing. The bad news is that the skeleton can be very complicated, or in fact, it can be a very poor shadow of the symplectic geometry, okay? So the bad news is the uh, skeleton can be uh, horribly singular, so very complicated, and not a good shadow, and not good... Uh, shadow or uh, not good memory <laughs> of the symplectic manifold. Maybe, maybe shadow is better. I didn't mean it was like doesn't fondly remember the symplectic manifold. Okay, so not a good shadow. So I'd like to just uh, give you a class of examples that are good to think about. So, <clears throat> so from this kind of definition of a Weinstein manifold that's tuned to handle attachments. So one should think that one builds a Weinstein manifold by attaching cells. And uh, first thing one starts with in 2n dimension 2n is a ball. So an open ball uh, in 2n dimensions, okay, with, a, say, a standard uh, conic uh, Leoville form. And then one draws inside the boundary some Legendrian sphere. Okay, so inside the boundary, one draws a Legendrian sphere. So the boundary of ball 2n is a, is a Sn minus 1 sphere. And inside of here, we pick some Legendrian sphere. So L equals a Legendrian sphere. Okay, and this is the attaching sphere for a handle, I mean a disk, that we'd like to put on. Okay, so here is a disk, disk of dimension n that we'd like to attach along this n minus 1 sphere, okay? Now what happens when you do this is that the resulting skeleton, and then you can 
complete this to a Weinstein manifold. Okay, so you'll get end up getting W is this kind of whole thing. Okay. Now, what happens, just if you follow the definitions, is that the, the new skeleton is the following. It consists of, the stable set consists of just the cone over this Legendrian, I'm not sure how to draw it, together with this disk attachment. Okay? So if you look at what I've done, you'll see that the L is just an N-sphere. Okay? So it remembers nothing about how this Legendrian was embedded in the boundary. Okay, so it, this n-sphere is a very simple topological space. I'm happy that we recovered a simple topological space, but it doesn't know anything about really the symplectic manifold because it doesn't, uh, doesn't know about this Legendrian. So in particular, the, if you believe that there should be some kind of kappa equals some theory of ribbon, then this kappa will have to be extremely complicated. It can't be like some kind of nice locally constant discrete structure because it's going to have to encode all possible Legendrian uh, spheres. So is, is, going to be, uh, is going to be incredibly complicated. So in some sense, you won't have accomplished anything if you do this. You will have said, okay, my symplectic manifolds of this type are n spheres, and they come equipped with something called kappa, which is incredibly complicated. Uh, okay, so, okay, so now I want to um, state a theorem uh, and then spend the rest of the talk uh, explaining the theorem. I'll ask again if there are any questions, comments. Okay, so um, the theorem is not yet, has not yet appeared, uh, but it's in joint work with Danny and Yasha, and I hope it will appear soon. And in some sense, <laughs> when we started this business, well, we started our discussions about three or four years ago, the theorem I'm going to state, I'm not supposed to tell you this, the theorem I'm going to state was what we used to call the trivial case. Okay, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> okay, so... Um, so the idea, let me tell you the idea and then the theorem. So the idea, so how are we going to do better than this kind of picture? So the idea is to go back to ribbon graphs and remember that we didn't just uh, study arbitrary ribbon graphs, we studied generic ones that were trivalent or univalent, okay? So the idea is, is ask for uh, the singularities of the skeleton L to be generic. And I put generic in quotes because this is one of the basic things I don't know how to do and would love to know how to do. So when we talk about, I erased it, but when we talk about the definition of a Weinstein manifold, the existence of the Morse function, the definition doesn't feel terrible because we know that Morse functions are generic among all functions. But from the perspective of the skeleton, this topological space, you can write down a Morse function and get a highly, highly non-generic skeleton. So the idea is what singularities of Skeleta are actually generic. Um, okay, so that's going to be part of what I'm going to try to explain. So here's a, a theorem. And I don't know, uh, what's the term? Uh, theorem star? Okay, so there's Dennis Gatesgar has introduced quasi-theorem into math. I don't know if that's a, a good idea or not. But okay, so theorem star in the spirit of Andre's talk, which is... Sorry? Oh, I see, like it's a ho up to homotopy or something? <laughs> I <see. Okay. laughs> this is like Drinfeld uh, when he wants to write, you know, the, the map. If it's only up to, it's T-H-H-E for, you know, up to homotopy. Okay, so, okay, I don't know. So, so <laughs> in progress, <laughs> or dependent, you know, I haven't checked my email in the last half hour, so maybe in regress, but anyway, it's, it's yeah, but I'm just, uh, this is a kind of very complicated inductive story that we're trying to tell. So this is joint with uh, uh, Danny, Alvarez, uh, Gavela, uh, Eli Oshberg, I don't know how one does this, okay, like this, and myself. And I should say that the four-dimensional version of this story, so four dimensions, so for a dimension of W, real dimension of W equals four, this is already a theorem, theorem of Laura Starkston. Uh, okay, so, great. 
So the theorem is the following. I'll state it in kind of a bit loose terms, and then I'll try to define the terms. So the theorem is that there, is a, there exists an equivalence between the following two types of uh, geometric objects. So on the one hand, I guess in this talk, they always appear on the right, are Weinstein manifolds. So over here, we'll have Weinstein manifolds. But for the time being, we don't understand all Weinstein manifolds. I'll explain what we do understand, and I'll call them positive Weinstein manifolds. Okay, so this will be a homotopic restriction on what we're able to prove at the moment. Um, okay, so there's positive Weinstein manifolds, and uh, let me just say what these are. So, okay, there are Weinstein manifold, M lambda, okay? But they also come with uh, element Xi, which one can think of in a variety of different ways, but it, essentially, if I look at the tangent bundle of M, okay, so this tangent bundle, I can give it an almost complex structure, and I can ask whether this is the complexification of some real plane field. Okay, so, and the assumption is that it is. Okay, so if you like, any Weinstein manifold has, uh, its tangent bundle is, uh, gives you a map, is a unitary bundle, and I'm asking it to be an orthogonal bundle. Okay, so that's what positive means. It's this extra structure, okay? Okay, so there's an equivalence between positive Weinstein manifolds and what we call positive arboreal spaces. Okay, so positive arboreal spaces, um, which I will explain what they are, but they will consist of a topological space. So this is gonna be like the analog of a ribbon graph. So this is gonna be some topological space and then it will come with the analog of a ribbon, so a kind of higher ribbon. I don't know. Higher ribbon. Okay. And uh, question? Yeah. So what? Yeah. So the question is, what is this equivalence? And at the uh, so. Yeah, so on this side, there's a natural notion of Weinstein homotopy. You write down a family over zero, one, and uh, so you think of it, you can think of it as a concordance, so a Weinstein structure on a one-dimensional higher space, and what we prove is that that's equivalent to this, where you put uh, arboreal concordance, so you put a, uh, uh, an arboreal family over zero, one. Okay, so I don't want to emphasize this, but the theorem is, it's not just on objects, it's kind of completely relative, so to the extent that you want to really understand things up to homotopy, it's, it's, a, it's a complete result, okay? So this, yeah, so this way is, is take the skeleton, and this way is, I don't know, some take the cotangent bundle, whatever that might be, okay? Okay, so, um, okay, so this is what I want to spend uh, the rest of the time um, uh, explaining. So I wanna just make a, a remark though that uh, made me happy. So when we, okay, so we always thought of this as somehow the trivial case, but uh, in part because we didn't know that it was actually quite robust. So I just want to make a, a remark that um, you can ask what Weinstein manifolds are positive. And the point is that asking for this reduction is not very far off from asking for a stable reduction. Okay, so in general, asking for an honest reduction of, you know, an honest reduction of structure group is, is much stronger than a stable reduction. But here we're in this kind of metastable range because of the, uh, the cell structure of the Weinstein manifold. So, um, so the, the set of possible Xi forms, a, has a surjective map to the possible stable Xi. Okay, so the first s simplification is that you don't really, I mean, it's important that you actually, for this equivalence, that you actually work with the unstable structure, but at least for its existence, you can just ask, does it have a stable structure? And this is something that it's very easy to check. So this, this for example, is non-empty for uh, complete intersections. So if I take W inside of CN, a complete intersection, complete intersection, so just cut out by k polynomials, then there's an obvious stable reduction, and so you in fact get some finite list of possible unstable reductions. So I always was, this always appeared to us as kind of too restrictive a setting, but it in fact it covers all 
complete intersections, and of course it covers cotangent bundles. So let me say another, yeah, another remark is that um, one of the main things we want to apply this to are cotangent bundles. So we want a theory that tells us when two cotangent bundles are isomorphic in the Weinstein category completely in terms of some kind of topological information. Okay, so, um, so I have about 10, 10 or 15? 15, great, okay. So, um, okay, so what I'd like to explain is what are arboreal spaces, and in particular, positive arboreal spaces, um, and uh, maybe just say a word or two about the, the proof of the theorem. Okay. Um, okay, and yeah, so when I say something about positive, when I, when I explain something about arboreal spaces, I'll try to include some comments about how this calculates the A model as well. Okay. Okay, so, um, so the, let me just say the first, before I tell you the definition of arboreal spaces, let me tell you the idea. Okay, so the idea is very simple. The idea is we want to blow up our skeleton at a singular point, okay? So the idea is that we want to blow up uh, the skeleton, uh, skeleton at the singular point. And of course, there's a natural notion of blow up in symplectic geometry. If you give yourself a symplectic manifold and say a point, you can blow up the point, but I don't know whether it's a feature or a bug, it changes the symplectic manifold. So a key point here is that we want to blow up the skeleton, but keep the same symplectic manifold. Okay, so I don't want to change my symplectic manifold. So this is not going to be a blow up in the usual sense of blow up in symplectic geometry or algebraic geometry. So let me draw a picture, a kind of... Uh, uh, example, or just a cartoon, of what we mean. So let's go back to this example here. So we have this skeleton inside, well, we, we picked some Legendre in here, in the boundary, and then we took its cone. And the cone was very singular at this point. Maybe we attached the disk as well. That's not really relevant for what I'm discussing. I'm discussing the fact that this singular point is highly singular. So what we want to do is blow up this point, but not put in a whole, uh, you know, like projective space or sphere there. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick a Lagrangian inside this ball, introduce it as a new zero section, and then spread out this singularity along its front projection, okay? So let me just draw a picture and hope it <laughs> conveys something, okay? So here's the old Here's the old Lagrangian L, okay? So the new Lagrangian, I won't change the symplectic manifold. I'm just going to change the skeleton. So the new thing I'm going to do is here I had a completely conic Liouville structure, okay? And now I'm going to say choose this plane as the zero section and so change the Liouville structure so that it's vertical, okay? Okay, so the upshot is that when this Legendrian comes into the boundary here, and now I need to take the cone, the cone no longer crowds everything at the point, it spreads it out. Okay, so the cone comes down and spreads it out, and what does it spread it out to? Well, it spreads it out to the front projection, which is some caustic, some, I don't know, uh, okay, complicated. <laughs> it doesn't look like a traditional picture. Okay, so some, some complicated picture like this, okay? So this is now where it gets attached to. Okay, so in some sense, this is, a, this is an improvement, okay? So we took this point and spread it out, so it's, it's a partial improvement. It's not a big improvement because, of course, the theory of singular caustics is, uh, you know, this is a, I don't know, I think Arnold showed that there's a kind of continuum of singular caustics. So, but singular caustics, caustics or fronts, are complicated. Okay, so we have a choice here, and there's a kind of traditional approach, or the approach that we're going to take in to, to kind of arrive at this theorem. So the traditional approach is you try to move this Legendrian around as best you can, this Legendrian sphere, so that the, the singularities you see of the front are as simple as possible. 
Okay, so there are beautiful theorems about that. That's not the approach we're going to take. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to concede that we're going to have singularities and introduce singularities into the Legendrian itself. Okay, so the... Um, so maybe this is idea one. I don't know. So the idea is we're going to blow up the skeleton at singular points and, and uh, inductively. So we're going to do these kind of blow-ups inductively. So, um, so, so also blow up smooth points. Okay, so in other words, let me just draw a kind of cartoon of what, what, what we'll find is we'll start with this picture and we'll know that we want to blow up this singular point here, so introduce caustics. Now, in general, we can't move this sphere in any way so that there won't be singularities, so we're going to accept singularities and rather move the sphere to being itself some singular complex, okay? So we're going to move the sphere, I'll explain what it looks like, into some singular position, okay? So if this sphere is L, this will be L tilde, okay? And this disk is itself going to be some kind of a singular object. I don't know how to draw it, but it's going to be kind of uh, e equivalent to the original disk, but now what we're going to have accomplished is that the singularities, the caustics here, are not going to have any new singularities. Okay? So the singularities of the caustics won't get worse and worse. Okay? So we're going to try to improve the Legendrians so that the caustics don't kind of propagate through the story. Okay? So, all right, so I don't know if that's e either visible or uh, understandable, but let me now make a formal definition, and, um, okay. And I hope it'll become apparent what I was saying, at least. Oh, maybe I shouldn't erase this. Okay. Sorry, in dimension four, you do... Yeah, so in dimension four... Um, so what Laura did in Dimension 4 is kind of organize the story. You don't actually, as Maxim says, you don't actually have to kind of improve anything. That's right. Okay, so... Okay, so now definition of arboreal. So uh, there are many different definitions. This is one way that I think you know you're uh, thinking about something worth thinking about. Um, so let me today give a kind of inductive inductive definition or characterization. Okay, so there's a kind of one fell swoop uh, definition, but let me just give an inductive one. Okay, so these are going to be local models for topological spaces, and in particular for Lagrangians, okay? So the base case, uh, you could take dimension negative one, but let's take dimension equals zero. So then the base case is just a point. So L equals a point inside the cotangent bundle of a point, which is W. Okay. Okay, the second axiom is stabilization. So if you ever see uh, L inside M, L inside M in arboreal uh, Lagrangian, then I have no problem with you crossing with the pair T star R uh, and R. So L cross R inside, uh, sorry, W. Let's keep it W. Inside uh, uh, W cross T star R is again an arboreal Lagrangian. Okay. And now the key one is what do we want to do when we, what do we need to say when we get to cones? And the point is, so, well, here's the following. So, cones. So, what we want to do is insist that we don't have any singularities of our caustics that we haven't seen before. So, um, so let's say L inside W is arboreal. It's an arboreal Lagrangian. Um, and now we embed W in the cosphere bundle at infinity of a manifold. So, we embed... W as a symplectic hypersurface inside some cosphere bundle. So this is a symplectic hypersurface. So co-dimension one symplectic 
embedding into this contact manifold, okay? So then L is now here, and we can ask about the, the front projection, okay? So, um, so let's assume, so if uh, L is uh, transverse, so this, under this embedding, is transverse to the vertical polarization. So this, this has a sphere, uh, Lagrangian polarization. So anytime I, I look at a cotangent bundle or its cosphere bundle, I see these Lagrangian or Legendrian fibers. So this is S star X, this is X, okay? And what I'm asking is whatever I had before, I want it, so let's just say it, that under this assumption, it implies that the cone of L together with the zero section is now again an arboreal Lagrangian. Okay. So there's maybe one other thing I need to say is that I want it to be in gen general position. So let me just write general position. Okay, so the picture... Let me just draw an example and a non-example. Okay, so, <clears throat> so here are two uh, pictures of the same space. So what we typically see when we have caustics are our Legendrians are embedded like this, and there'll be singularities of these, these projections, or maybe I should, if this is the cosphere bundle, I should draw this in this dimension. And so what I'll see is a new singularity given by that tangency. But what we can ask for instead is to allow singularities, allow this to have a ribbon graph structure. Maybe it looks like a line, and then it has a spike coming off it in this direction, and so on. Okay? But each of these pieces is still transverse to the foliation. Okay? So you can imagine that I could replace this parabola with some kind of collection of lines and still capture the geometry but have it be transverse, and then what I'll see here is kind of no worse than what I saw up there, okay? So there's a spike coming off of a line, okay? So the point is, in general, the singularities propagate and get worse and worse, but with this assumption, we're essentially saying taking cones should not introduce any more singularities than you already had before. Okay, so I have two minutes or no? Okay, so, um, so let me just say a word or two in uh, closing about uh, some of the nice properties of these singularities. I won't have a chance to say much about, I mean, say anything about the proof of the theorem, um, but uh, I hope it, it, it kind of the statement at least stands for itself. But let me say a word or two about why these are called arboreal and what about calculations with them. Okay, and then I'll quit. So just uh, if I can have two minutes. Ah, uh, let me say uh, what, yeah, so let me, <laughs> okay, yeah, there's too much to say. So positive, okay, so this is the definition of arboreal. And then inside of this class, every time you make projections, you will find some quadratic forms, okay? And the, so um, positive will mean that all the quadratic forms are positive. So I'll, I'll say something else in a moment, but it's a kind of, it's discrete within uh, the data that we already have, okay? Uh, yeah, sorry, that's not satisfying, but... Uh, okay, so let me just say some nice facts. Nice facts about arboreal Lagrangians. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finish. So the first is you can ask, where does the name come from? And the answer is that if you look at the local models that come out of this, they're indexed by uh, rooted trees. So the local models are indexed by rooted trees. So a rooted tree just means a graph that's acyclic, I don't finite, so on. But it also has some root. So here's a tree and here's a root. Okay, so in particular you can think of it as a kind of special case of a directed graph. Okay, so the singularities are indexed by these rooted trees. The positive case is secretly where I there's there's secretly you can sort of signs to edges, you can ask for putting a sign to the edges, and this will uh, give you a, a general arboreal singularity, and positive equals all plus. Okay, so I know that's not telling you anything, but it gives you a sense of, of kind of what this positivity is saying. Okay, and then the the 
maybe the second and last thing I'll say um, is that um, is that the A model of W. So if I give you a Weinstein manifold, and I, let's say it has a skeleton L. T, which itself is just one of these local models. So you can think of this as the local A model near one of these arboreal singularities. Uh, so the local A model is just the same thing as modules over the tree T with this, these arrows. Okay. So this tells you that uh, to calculate the entire uh, A model, at least for these positive Weinstein manifolds, you will be able to, by the theorem, choose a positive arboreal skeleton, and then the local A model is completely calculated, and now you will just take assemblies of these, these kind of local categories. Okay, there's lots I'd like to say, but I think it's time. Thank you very much. Okay, here's your chance to learn something more. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah, so that's right. I mean, it, you, it essentially question? comes down to a stable calculation. Stable. So that's right. What was the question? Uh, so the question was, is this positivity for Weinstein manifold vanishing of uh, churn classes? And my comment, maybe you heard, <laughs> was that, you know, up to this kind of lifts to a stable structure, uh, unstable structure, it's, it's uh, yeah, I just confirmed. <laughs> so as far as I know, uh, one can glue... Uh, for Kai categories of two-dimensional real surfaces by gluing the ribbon graphs. Right. Uh, now I was asking myself in high dimensions, as far as I know, Foucault categories cannot be glued together anymore to give the Foucault category of the gluing. But uh, maybe still one can glue uh, these higher ribbon graphs. What are the associated Foucault categories? What, what right. do you know? Okay, so I think now the technology has advanced uh, or is in the process of advancing. So there, are, um, there is a work in progress of Vivek Shenda and his collaborators that will, that will explain that Foucault categories of Weinstein manifolds can be glued, and um, it will all be compatible with this. So on the one hand, you can decide to now go and calculate using this, and you can blame me if you ever go wrong. I mean, if you get different answers, I claim you won't. Uh, <laughs> and their theorem will also confirm that eventually. So we'll confirm the claim that you won't get different answers. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Oh, here is There's a... a oh, more, yes. Is that a question or... Yeah. No, no, here. <laughs> okay. Can I? All right. No. It, it, and the question session. Okay, we have a, let's thank David again. Thanks.